Hey listeners. These two jerks wanted me to announce that Mateo will be returning to the Silicon Valley Comic Con, in San Jose, California, this Saturday, April 7th. If any of you planned on going, keep an eye out for Mateo's fat body, and demand that he give you some free WhatCast stickers or maybe a t-shirt. Just be like, hey, bubble tits. Got any of them stickers? And he will be like, the fuck you calling bubble tits, then you'll be like, hey, chill out. I'll listen to the white cast. And he'll be all, oh shit. Right on. Here you go. Easy peasy. This episode's brought to you by Studio Headphones. Go to studio.com and enter the word what at checkout and save swift. <laughs> and save 50. <laughs> And save fifteen percent. That's a lot of percent. You know, Mike, as much as I want monsters to be real, I think for the most part, we can conclusively say that there are no monsters in existence anymore. Well, I, I think it, it all depends on what you mean by monsters, because, I mean, you've got rapists and child molesters and mass murderers and people running into schools and shooting people. I would consider that a monster. That's just a human monster. The most monstrous monster of all. Coming out heavy. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's it's unavoidable at this point. People are fucking monsters. But also in the world of of nature, there's monsters. You know, it, it doesn't have to be some mythical beast to be a monster. But when you really think about it, where do we draw the line between something just being a a predatory animal? Or being a monster, where where is that line drawn? Yeah, there's so many attacks that you hear from all sorts of different wild animals to where somebody just gets bit, you know, be it in the water or on land, they just get bit. But there's mm. some rare cases where these animals are pissed. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look at uh, killer bees, for instance. You know, they're or, or just bees in general. Bees in general are responsible for more deaths than a lot of animals on this planet. But would you ever consider a bee a monster? Are they a monster by themselves, or or do they become a monster as a swarm, or are they not monsters because they're insects? You know, where where's the line drawn? Is it the the amount of murders they commit, the amount of human lives they take? I wonder if we took dinosaurs and made them super content and fed them and like just hung around them after they were full just gorging themselves would they be so quick to attack or or all these animals attacking out of hunger like what percentage well you, you can't even say that because you look at just again take take bees for instance and you cannot say that they're killing for hunger they're killing for what they they think is protection and you can look at the th- Animals like the water buffalo or, or the hippopotamus, who are responsible for many deaths in Africa every year, but they're both vegetarians. So, I mean, think about something equipped with with plates and horns, like like a triceratops or an ankylosaurus or a stegosaurus, and just think of of what damage they can do just because either they feel like they're territory is being encroached upon or or that they have to defend themselves but i mean a a triceratops swinging its head around its horns are going to destroy you or (laughs) or a stegosaurus swinging its tail just once you're like oh shit i'm impaled by fucking tail spikes now what what am i going to do you know but are they monsters well i mean they're dinosaurs so i guess they would be monsters but you know is is a hippopotamus a monster that's that's the question. So let's break up these animals that attack people into three parts. And you brought up a good one that I didn't consider. So there's probably out of hunger. Mm. And then we'll we'll throw category two is in uh, like defense or protection. Yeah. yeah. 
Should we add like fear, like wounded and? Yeah, that, I mean, but I don't think that's necessarily. That's usually if it's in fear, it's going to be, uh, you know, attacking to get you the fuck out of there. Okay, so we, yeah, we'll throw that with protection then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's let's add another category, and that's the love of fucking murder. Murder. Hey, we got effects now. Let's do it up. Murder. Mike got his his mixer, so you're, we're gonna destroy this episode with plenty of sound effects. I don't know about that. Sound effects. Echo. That's not echo. God damn it. This sounds like you're in an empty church. Ooh. Ooh, empty church. All right, let's get to this then, Mike. Yeah. What's the first tale of a murderous well, son right. of a bitch animal? <laughs> so th- there's a lot of stories in India of um, of tigers that, that murder the peoples. Some of them are by areas. Um, there was There's this area called the Sundarbans in India, and Bengal tigers in that area used to be known to kill 50 to 60 people a year. Wow. And it was just the, the tigers from this region, and for there were 100 tigers, uh, give or take, that lived in this area. And for for the area, it's thought to be one of the largest single populations of tigers anywhere in the world, uh, just because it's was, in this area there's 100 tigers. And, you know, usually they're not that closely grouped together. Uh, but in the years, more recent years, the kill rate has dropped. And this is due to better techniques that manage the animals. And so now that they're aware that these animals are man eaters, they, they've been able to kind of um, protect people more. So now they're only down to about three people per year. Well, that's a relief. Yeah, but this is this is seems to be the population, and I think a lot of it has to do with the amount of people that are in the area. But there was a tiger that was probably the most brutal killer on the face of this planet that ever existed. It was it's one tiger, and it's called the Champawat tiger, and she originated in Nepal. She killed around 200 men and women before she was finally driven out of Nepal. They weren't able to kill her. She was chased out of Nepal, and she moved to the Champawat district in North India. And once she was there, she killed another another 230-something people. So her total kill is, her total amount of human deaths is thought to be 436 people. Holy horseshit, that's incredible. Yeah, and she got pretty brazen. She would walk into villages during the day and just start roaring, which would cause people to start running. And as they were running, she would chase one of them down and kill them. Holy right shit. Right in the middle of the day. Completely brazen. Yeah, just flushing people out with her roar? That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but she, she was eventually killed. Uh, her last victim was a 16-year-old girl. And the... Uh, somewhat famous author, hunter, and conservationist Jim Corbett was the one that that killed this tiger. And after he killed her, he saw that her upper and lower canine teeth on the right side of her mouth were broken. And on the upper one, the tooth was uh, broken in half. But on the lower one, it was right down to the bone. And because of this injury, it would have prevented the tiger from killing its natural prey. So it had to adapt to its injury, and if it wanted to stay alive, it had to go after easy prey. And with humans being pussies, we were <laughs> we were nothing to the tiger. We were number one on a, the the yeah, next. It's like, oh, you you're on two legs. You're really slow. I can knock you over and eat you no problem. You shit your pants when I yell. Yeah, all I have to do is come into your your village, roar, and you guys shit yourselves. Four hundred and thirty six people. Jeez. 436 people have murdered over its life. It had to solely be living on people. Yeah. Yeah, because that's all it could kill. Because without its canine, it couldn't bring down larger game. Yeah. Because they they use their canine to either cut off the windpipe 
or break the the spine at the base of the neck. And uh, without these two teeth, it only had it on one side. So, you know, it's going to make things a lot harder to take down a fucking deer. So instead, just eat the shit out of some people. With numbers like that, she had to have been solely eating people, especially because they're smaller yeah. from what she was used to eating alone. That, that, right. that alone. Yeah, you can almost say that she was murdering people for fun at, with that number, but mm-hmm. the injury explains a lot. That's just some yeah. unfortunate circumstances for those people who live nearby. Yeah, and it, it's just it's crazy to me that that it got to that point where she was able to kill over 400 people without anyone killing her off. You know, you'd think like they would start come, having plans like, all right, if the tiger comes in, get the 10 biggest dudes with really big sticks and just surround the fucker and club it. <laughs> that would be awesome. I would want to be know? one of those men. Yeah, just get the biggest guys in the village, give them some beating sticks, and be like, go, surround this fucking thing and club it so it stops eating us all. Yeah, how many people would have to die before they took some action? I mean, like Apparently 436. <laughs> that was their limit. There will not be a 437th. We've met our match. <laughs> Over my dead body. I think it would be yeah. like, what, three? We'd be like, we got a problem. We have a serious problem, guys. Yeah, you'd think so. Unless unless there were gun deaths, then there, there's no problem there. You know, kill as many people as you want with a gun. There are no gun problems. But if you have a pit bull that bites somebody on the hand, you got to kill that fucker right off the bat. <laughs> there's a lot of tigers in India that have reached mythical status. And, and some of them have really cool names like Thack Man Eater. Ooh. And, and then there's there's some that are just the tiger of wherever they're from. And some of them get get the names like like Thack Man Eater, for instance. Um she only killed four people. But um she was actually the last tiger to be killed by by Jim Corbett. It was his final hunt. He took out the Thack Man Eater. But when he when I'm he the finally thack man. sorry yeah. <laughs> when he finally killed her, um, he saw that she had two old gunshot wounds, and one of them had become s- septic, and because of the gunshot wounds, she again wasn't able to track down her normal prey because she was injured. So she turned to people, but. In this area, they only let her get away with four kills before they called Jimmy C in to wipe the place or wipe the floor with her. But uh, previous to this one, th- this is the only other one I'll I'll out on. There's there's a ton of mythical status man eating tigers in in India, but um, the the tigers of Chogar, it was a pair of of Bengal tigers, and one was an old tigress, and the other was her daughter. And over a five-year period, they killed 64 people in northern India in an area that spanned 1,500 square miles. And the the figure of 64 people is I, the, the number that's agreed upon, but there's natives in the area that say it was at least 120 people that these two tigers killed. Damn. And, and what, what span of time? Over a five-year period. When talking about the numbers the natives like i said they say that they the pair killed 120 people but the natives also do not take into account victims who survived the attack or victims that died from wounds after the attack they they were only counting in the 120 people that were eaten by these tigers hmm yeah that number could double quite easy then yeah so there were even more people beyond that that they're saying that these tiger killed but that was eventually hunted down by Jim Corbett as well. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of, like I said, a lot of stories of man-eating tigers. There there was one I actually read about last year that had killed, um, I forgot what, what area of India it was in, but it killed two people and they moved it to a, a tiger reserve area in India. And once they moved it, it killed another two people. So <laughs> the government actually put a hit out on this Ooh, tiger. Dun, 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 dun. 
but then he had, but then there were people that were trying to get that hit overturned, saying that they could move it to a different area farther away from from where people live, so that the tiger's not going to kill them. And um, I don't know how that ended up working out. That was just that was last October when the the process started. So maybe it's not even hasn't even been decided yet. Maybe someone already smoked it. I don't know. Just don't know. Man, that's like that's unimaginable to have to live with that as a actual fear. I mean, that one place you're talking about that had a concentration of what was it? Two hundred tigers. One hundred. One hundred. You you know you go to the store at night. You got to kiss your family, every single one of them, before you leave. It's, I mean, just with those two, the, the the two that did or killed the 64 official count. I mean, that's enough. Mm-hmm. That's a shit ton of people. Yeah. And that's only two of them to sit there and say, okay, well, there's not one or two pissed off man eating tigers around here. <laughs> there's over a over hundred almost. Yeah. And I've, I've heard, I, I believe that this is, <clears throat> that this is the area where the water is kind of brackish so there's a line of thought that some of these tigers might be going insane because they're drinking salt water but i I don't know if there's any accuracy to that or not Hmm, that's interesting though yeah pissed off sea drinkers yeah we was just thirsty we just want water i don't know how scared i'd be if i was going to be eaten by a giant cat like that I don't, it's not a, a animal that I'm particularly afraid of, but I mean, you, of course I'd be like, fuck, I'm a dead man. That's it. Yeah. I mean, really, what are you going to do? Yeah. You, you've got a cat that weighs as much as you do, if not more, with fucking huge claws and like six inch long canines. What are you going to do? <laughs> it's incredible, dude. I remember when I was a kid and I got my first kitten. And just the damage those fucking little babies can do. I was like, fuck, yeah, well, I'm, imagine this 200 like pounds. They've needle teeth, man. <laughs> yeah. But just add 200 pounds to that cat. Yeah. You're like, oh, man. Yeah. You quickly realize, like, that's the fucking super predator. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's like one of those situations. If if it wants you, it's going to take you. What are you, what are you going to do? Yeah. You going to punch it like it has never been kicked in the head by a fucking deer? Can you punch <laughs> as hard as deer kicks? I don't think so. Anytime we go to any like animal place, like, a, I don't know, some zoo or something, and they have the mm-hmm. lions come out and the people are in there with them, I don't look. I can't look. I mean, there's this 50-50 chance that thing They're going to Siegfried and Roy them. Yeah, just go over there and pop your head like a grape in between its jaws. Have my kids freak out. I'm like, no, I just sit there and pray the whole time. God, Mateo, you worry about the weirdest shit. Dude, I don't want to watch people get eaten to death by tigers. Yeah, but what are the chances? I mean, they they feed them. They're gonna. They're not gonna just attack and and murder someone for fun. <laughs> you just told us of a shit ton that did. I wonder how doped up those animals they, are. They were hungry though. They were hungry, <laughs> Mateo. What would you kill if you were hungry? Are you a monster, Mateo? <laughs> if I had to be. Are you willing to murder for food? Murder. Oh, I changed the effect. That sucks. <laughs> no effects for you do you think they actually drug the animals the more dangerous ones like that before they make them do their old tricks at places like that i don't know I, I wouldn't be surprised if if there was some sort of sedative involved sometime but then again if you get an animal from a very young age and you're able to bond with it and train it and it sees you as you know it's but you've been there since its birth, so it's used to you. You're the one that gives it food, so it knows the food comes from you. Why would it attack, you know? But on the other hand, it is a wild animal. And, you know, how many times have we seen elephants go rogue and, and just start randomly attacking, you know? And it's not to say that animals are evil, or elephants are evil animals at all, but... You know, it, you, you got to understand the, the mind state of an animal. You take it out of its natural habitat and you're making it do shitty tricks that it, its body wouldn't ever do in, in nature. And you're, you're confining it to small cells. It's not able to to uh, traverse miles of savanna or forest or wherever. It's going to get a little stir crazy. And it's going to lash out. And it's not the animal's fault. It's our fault for basically imprisoning it, you know? 
But in, in this case, and in, in, in all the cases we're going to mention, these are animals in the wild. These are animals that are choosing to hunt people. But again, it's, it's animals being animals. It's, you know, they're, they're not looking at us as people. We're in their area. We become a prey item. You, you enter an animal's habitat. If there's a big predator there, there's a real chance you could become prey. That's, I fucking wouldn't be able to cope with living with that fear. <laughs> and that's why you stand out of the ocean, right? Yep. <laughs> I will not be a snack. No way. I know the rules. I'm in its <laughs> house. I'm not, I'm not welcome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that is the, when you go in the ocean, you do kind of give up a lot of control. Yep. I, I just saw this video today. My, my son showed me, it was in, um, some harbor in Australia and these kids were jumping off of a pier into the, into the ocean. And this dude jumps in with a GoPro and he, he jumps in and then comes up out of the water and all his friends are up above him going shark shark. So he turns around and like 10 feet away from this great white shark swims by oh. and then it drops down and he keeps go like he's trying to get out of the water, but he doesn't want to lose sight of it. And then at one point he looks down and it's like five feet away from him. It's coming right at him. And then it like turns at the last minute. And that's usually what they'll do before they'll come in for an exploratory bite. They get close and then they swim by so they can really check you out and see what you're all about. And then if they're really interested, they'll come and give you a little bite. But typically great whites won't eat people, but their teeth are so sharp and their mouth is so big even an exploratory bite can be fatal. You know, you can lose your leg and bleed out in a matter of minutes. Oh, yeah. You'll learn that in Jaws. <laughs> no, because in Jaws, it's it's an insatiable monster from hell that just eats and eats. Because, I mean, great white sharks, they'll eat like once a month. They eat food that's got high fat content. They like seals. They like fucking tuna. We're, we're not on the menu for great white sharks. We're, we're very bony, very little meat to bone ratio. You know, we're not going to provide them with very much. It's like being, I'm really hungry, but you just get one single fucking slider from White Castle. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck is this? Or one, chi one chicken wing, I think would be better. Yeah. Here, here's a chicken wing. But I'm starving. Nope, chicken wing, just one. Enjoy. Yeah, they're going to look for better things to eat than people. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you're you're really hungry. You can either have this really awesome steak or this chicken wing. What, 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 what do you want? I will take the steak, please. And so will the great white shark. <laughs> Only in this case, the steak is a seal. But I anyway, I hate sharks. I love sharks. They're fantastic. I I all people have a fucking fear of sharks. I know I'm not special, but I have a phobia <laughs> of sharks. Like I can't watch Shark Week. I, I cry whenever I have to shower. <laughs> no. But I, I seriously, I don't even like looking at the damn things. I used to be like that as a kid. My my grandma had this old National Geographic book, and it was all under the sea creatures. And it started with mythical accounts of sea monsters. So they had like those old wood carvings yeah. of, of the sea monsters attacking the ships. And then immediately following that, they had the scariest fucking shark pictures that have ever been caught on camera ever. And they, I couldn't even look at them as a kid. They scared the fucking shit out of me. I mean, granted, I was probably like three or four years old. So it's, you know, and then shortly after that, I ended up developing quite a love for sharks that exists to this day. They're, they're cool creatures. I mean, they need to read about and I, I don't, I don't really hate them. Like I don't want all sharks to be fucking <laughs> dead or anything like that. But I just, I just, I don't see how people go into the ocean knowing that that variety of predator exists there. And it's like, not, it's not like only great whites are fucking deadly. Yeah, I mean, any any type of shark can can. Well, I shouldn't say any type of shark, but the, the again, it's it's the the you look at the st statistics. And the millions upon millions of people that enter the ocean every year, and there's typically less than 10 shark attacks that happen. And out of those 10 shark attacks, very few are fatal. 
Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're just not on the menu, so it's really nothing that you have to worry about, except for you know one case where there's a shark with a vendetta. But we'll talk about that later. Yeah, we're gonna talk about <laughs> one pissed off shark. I mean, yeah. he he wants all people to be dead. He hates sharks like <laughs> some people hate sharks. I remember one time when I was a kid when I was able to watch shit like Shark Week, because I loved sharks. I thought they were cool, but then, like, just like with the little kitten, you realize, like, oh, that thing would fucking saw you in half. Fuck the ocean. But as they were playing calls that viewers had left, like messages. They gave some hotline number out, and some lady fucking went off about how they're water demons, and they should all be struck from the from every ocean. It was hilarious. And th- we'll talk about that shark. <laughs> Yeah, be- before we get into the life aquatic thought, I I would like to stick with scary cats if that's okay with you. If you have more on cats, let's do it. They're, they're like they're like the sharks of the land. They are. I've got this story. It's it's from uh, Eastern Missouri about this cat named Fluffy. This cat was an <laughs> asshole. With a name like Fluffy, he had to be. Yeah, worst worst cat of all time. Attacked everybody. He couldn't pet the cat. Even its owner was afraid of it. They had, to, they had to sleep with one eye open until Fluffy clawed that eye out. Really? No, that's that, the whole thing is a completely made oh, up story. I was so stoked. I was like, <laughs> this now. Was... Yes, yeah, the murderous house cat. House I knew cat. it. <laughs> it is named Fluffy. I need to warn every cat owner I know now. <laughs> yeah, no. F- Fluffy, Fluffy is a made up cat. I mean, not not the name. I'm sure there's plenty of cats named Fluffy, but he didn't claw anybody's eyes out. He stabbed them. No, <laughs> he got a fork and he stabbed that son of a bitch. <laughs> but I, I, are you familiar with with Val Kilmer? Oh yeah, the worst Batman of all. I don't know. I think he was better than George Clooney. He's the best Doc Holliday of all, though. Oh yeah, he is. He's he's the best Goose. I know he was Iceman, wasn't he? Yes, Goose. He is... was the best Ice Man. Goose is the one that died. Yep. Yeah, he was the best, not Tom Cruise. <laughs> but anyway, he was he was also in a movie called The Ghost in the Darkness. Are you familiar with this? Oh yeah, I love that movie. So the the story took some, or the movie took some liberties from the actual event, but it was a real event that actually happened. Were you aware of that? No. Oh well. Yeah, uh, it really happened. So for for people that aren't familiar with The Ghost in the Darkness, I'll give you some background on on what this whole thing was about. Um, Essentially, it's about people that get murdered by lions. But um, the the reason behind it, it wasn't just some lions out just killing fools. It was there was some purpose behind it. Um, But again, it was it's. It's a thing where man goes out into the wild and puts himself within the the natural ecosystem. So he's going to become part of that world, whether he likes it or not. This began when the British started construction on a railroad in their East African colony. Um, They started construction on the railroad in 1896, and they had it planned that it was going to run from the coastal port city of Mombasa in Kenya go through uh, Lake Victoria, and then end up in Uganda. And the reason they wanted to build this railroad was to make an easy mode of transport for goods and supplies between Africa and Europe. And they hoped that by developing this, uh, this railway and this easy method of transport that it would encourage Europeans to move into the East African colonies. They called this the Uganda Railroad, but it was mocked by people um, that didn't think it was going to work or thought that they were wasting their time. And they called it the Lunatic Line and said it ran from nowhere to nowhere. Ooh. They showed them. But they they had a a firm plan uh, and and an outline for, for what they wanted to do. And the railroad was planned to span 580 miles Along the route, it was going to cross several rivers and valleys, and they had planned that it would take 30 years to complete. And they were going to first hit Nairobi in 1899, then Lake Victoria in 1901, and eventually in Uganda in 1928. But because they were dealing with with such a, a 
large amount of rail that they had to lay down. They brought in workers from India. And so work began in 1896. And two years into its construction, uh, in February 1898, the railroad had reached the Tsavo River in Kenya, which was 130 miles northwest of Mombasa. And the workers there had to build a temporary bridge that would let the workers cross the river and continue building on the other side. So they built the the temporary bridge, went over, continued construction of the the uh, railway. A month later in March, they began construction on the permanent bridge, and a British Army colonel named John Henry Patterson was brought in to oversee the construction. Is that is that Val were. Kilmer? Yeah, that that was that was Val Kilmer's character. He was Patterson. But uh, during this process, because of the building material he needed to create this permanent bridge, he needed stone from all over. So he had thousands of workers that were scattered in camps along the railway uh, that spanned 20, 20 miles. And Patterson was responsible for all of these guys that were spread out over 20 miles in camps. Within days of his arrival, people began to disappear. So he was told at first that there was a lion attacking the workers, but he didn't believe it because there were all these people. And from what he knew, lions weren't going to attack a large group of people that were, you know, making all sorts of noise. You know, it's a construction camp that, of of course, there's going to be shenanigans and, and drinking and during the day, all sorts of loud activity. But uh, the reports of the lions kept coming in, and eventually remains of dead workers began to be found. So throughout the course of these attacks, it started to become clear that it wasn't just one lion. There were at least two lions that were involved. And every few days, at least one of these lions would strike at one of the, the campsites scattered along this 20-mile stretch. And then another lion would come in and attack the horses or the donkeys, goats, whatever, and and occasionally would also attack people. So to protect themselves, these Indian workers began constructing fences around their their camps. And they would weave together thorny branches from the acacia trees, and they would keep campfires burning throughout the night, thinking that the light would keep the lions away. And even if the lions came in, the the thorny branches that, that they wove into fences would would uh, prevent the lions from coming through because they'd be getting poked and jabbed. But it wasn't enough to stop them. And on one occasion, one of the lions actually clawed its way into a tent and attacked the man that was sleeping there. But uh, in all the confusion that it that ensued from this attack, the lion ended up dragging away the mattress instead of the worker. Ooh. And once it realized that it had the mattress, it dropped the mattress and just took off. Do you remember that part in the movie when they set up all that shit? It just walked right into their camp. It's like, thanks, now I can see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, they can see in the dark anyway. They're fucking cats. Evil little bastard. <laughs> <laughs> but th- th- these lions, oh man... They ended up getting called the Ghost in the Darkness. They're, those are the nicknames because, and you'll see why. That it's just unbelievable what what these were able to get away with and how, and how they were able to escape. And it took so long before they were actually finished off. But a month later in April, the railroad continued to to truck along, and they were forty miles away from the, the Savo River. Uh, But they were still working on this bridge. So they had cut down the workers that were working on the bridge to only a few hundred. And all the rest went on to help with the rest of the railroad. Uh, So the workers were now concentrated into camps at the bridge site rather than spread out along a 20-mile stretch. So once this happened, the lions began to stay around this area. And they would concentrate their hunts around these camps. So Patterson getting sick of these lions attacking his men began spending nights perched in a tree with his rifle hoping that he'd run into one of the lions but he could never catch sight of them. What an asshole that wouldn't work anyway they're excellent tree climbers. 
Yeah, but he could. Lions actually aren't very good at, at climbing trees. I mean, well, they can climb them. They're not very good at getting back down, though, in a lot of cases. <laughs> I remember seeing this documentary on, um, it was called Predators at War. And it was about um, what happens to predators during the dry season. And the competition for food is insane. And leopards routinely will kill and then climb up trees with their kill and eat in the tree so that nothing will steal their food away. But um, these lions were getting desperate, so they chased this leopard up the tree. The leopard got out and was able to escape without being killed out by the lion's buddies. But then this lioness went up and that was in the tree, got the knocked the food down so the rest of the lions had the food and then she tried to get down and she broke her neck and died oh damn yeah, <laughs> yeah so you know don't chase a leopard into a tree lion <laughs> any lions listening please i, I hope you learned your lesson <laughs> but even if the, even if that was an issue he had his fucking rifle so in the time that the lion's climbing up the tree he's like ah shoot your face instead <laughs> so he 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 wasn't able to, to spot any of them anyway, so it was a non-issue. But one night, one of the lions came into the camp, and um, they they had a hospital set up in case any workers got injured. And there there was a worker in there at the time, and he ended up getting dragged away by by one of the lions. So the next night, Patterson decided, you know, maybe we should change where the hospital is. Maybe they know. Maybe they can smell the blood. Or whatever. So he changes the position of the hospital. And the next night, a lion comes in, drags another person out of the hospital. Oh. The next morning, they found his head and one of his hands. Ooh. Yeah. It's a serial killer. It's like chopping bodies up now. Yeah. Yeah. Leaving like, ornaments. You know there, there's, there's no meat on the head and hands. You guys we, can we have that this. back. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe send it to his next of kin. <laughs> so... He again moves, Patterson that is, again moves the hospital. But this time he comes up with an idea. He gets a railroad car and he puts some cattle inside and moves it to the location of where the hospital was. So he waits there along with the camp doctor and uh, he sat up all night waiting for the lion to come back. Finally, the lion enters the camp. And it managed to get inside the box car and killed one of the cattle, but it wasn't able to figure out how to get the cattle back through the fence, the, the thorny tree fence. So it dropped the cow and then decides it's going to start stalking Patterson and the doctor. Oh. And so it, it, it attacks Patterson. And as it's trying to take him down, he manages to get a shot off and he shoots the the lion in the mouth and it breaks off one of its teeth and then the lion bolted out of there so it wasn't a kill shot and he wasn't even really sure how badly he damaged the lion itself but he knew he broke off one of its teeth so it's suddenly not a ghost there's you know he was able to hit it it's able to be hit if it's able to be hit you should be able to kill it but uh after he shot it the lions left the area for a while. And so he thought that maybe he scared it away. But he wanted to be sure. So just in case it would come back, he developed this trap. And he put it in the railway car. So what would, the way it worked was anything that came in through the railway car, uh, a cage would drop down. Some iron board bars would drop down over the door. And it would prevent anything from getting out. And Patterson decided to use himself as bait in this in this trap. And he set out waiting for the lions, but they never came. And he later found out that after he had shot them, what had happened was the lions ran down the, the line, the, the railway line, and began raiding one of the construction camp miles down the road. But after a few weeks, they came back, and their first time back, one of the lions entered in through the fence, grabbed a worker, dragged it out of the fence, and as soon as he got it out of the fence, the second lion came in, and they went to town and just started eating the worker 30 yards away from the camp. 
Everybody got to hear it and everything. Yeah, yeah. So for the next several months, the lions would come back in through the camp and they'd eat a worker. And finally on December 1st, most of the workers were called out and uh, they boarded a train and left. And at this point, there were only a small number left to finish the bridge. Two days after December 1st, uh, the, the local superintendent of police in the area came in with 20 men to help hunt down the lions. And the first night, one of the lions entered into the boxcar trap that Patterson had set up. And it came in, the gate went down, it was trapped in there. And all these men were firing at it while it was trapped in this, in this boxcar, firing it at close range. Somehow, none of them were able to hit it, and the lion was able to escape. Oh my god. Can you imagine the fear that would must have set in with the people or the workers? I mean, yeah. like, yeah, it's, it is a ghost. It, it turned right back into a mythical beast. Yeah, yeah. So the, the superintendent and his men, after that, they spent several days looking for the lions, but they weren't able to find them. So eventually they left, and, and uh, once they left, they gave Patterson... A high-powered hunting rifle to to shoot the lion with. So they they had only stuck around for a few days, and um, December 9th, the lions came back, and they killed a donkey. And as it was eating the donkey, Patterson instructed a group of his workers to approach the lion, making as much noise as possible to try to chase it out into the open. And they were successful, and the lion took off running, and once it was out in the open... Patterson came out with his rifle and he shot it and he was able to wound it, but not kill it. So they decided to leave the donkey thinking that if they left the donkey, the lion would be back later that night to reclaim his kill. So Patterson built a wooden platform that he could sit on top of and wait for the lion. And the lion came back, completely ignored the dead donkey and went right for Patterson. No way. So this thing is yeah. now out for blood. He is a murderer. He's He had free food right there. Patterson shot it. <laughs> he wanted pissed. revenge. Yeah, he wanted he wanted vengeance. That's twice he so, shot at it and blew it, I might add. Yeah. Well, this time the lion comes back, sees Patterson there, ignores the dead donkey, and approaches Patterson. As it charges in for the kill, Patterson gets two shots off, and he kills it. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, so there, there's one down, and at this point, they they had a pretty good idea that it, it was just one left, that there were only two of them working together. So a few nights later, the one that was remaining returns, and it attacked two goats that they had. So then they weren't able to get it that night. No one was able to spot it. They just saw the what was left of the two goats. So. Patterson sets out three more goats as bait, tying them to a sort a short section of a railroad tie. The lion returned, killed one of the goats, and then it dragged the entire railroad tie, still attached to the goat, out into the into the uh, trees or whatever. And Patterson tried to shoot at it, and he missed. The next morning, he ordered a group of workers along. Well, he led a group of workers. Uh, down the trail to find the lion. They were able to locate it. The lion ran off. So Pedersen decides to build another wooden platform. And he's going to sit on top of this and wait for the lion to return. And when it did, he was able to hit it twice with his rifle, but not kill it. After he hit it twice, it ran back into the woods and he didn't see it again. Uh, so 10 days went by. Nothing happened. And after after that point, Patterson figured that the lion had died of the wounds from the rifle. But then, the lion returned, and it tried to attack a worker that was in a tree. But the guy in the tree was able to escape. So that night, Patterson, Patterson set up an ambush in the same tree where it attacked the worker. And when the lion returned, he shot it two more times, hit it both times, but it ran away again. Are you kidding me? I mean, it, it couldn't have healed from the first two shots in 10 days. Yeah. So four, four shots total so far it's taken. And this, it, it, I don't know if this was this, the same one he shot in the mouth before, or if the other one was the one he shot in the mouth. I don't know which was which. 
So potentially this could have been shot five times by him at this point. It's still alive. <laughs> but the next morning they were, uh, Patterson and his crew were able to follow a trail of blood and they found the lion. And once they found the lion, the lion this time wasn't running and it charged at them. So Patterson pulls his rifle out and brought it down with two more shots and it was finally killed December 29th. Were, were these animals abnormally large or? No, they, they're just regular lions. Um, the only thing was they, they were both males. Um, but for some reason, the male lions in the Savo region don't have manes. So they're just, you know, they're bald headed males. Mm. Um, but the idea or what they think is that these were both brothers. And sometimes if a male lion doesn't have a pride, uh, it'll band together with other males to form a small pack or, or a partnership. And that's, that's what they did here. But the amount of people that these lions actually ended up killing isn't really agreed upon, but the attacks spanned over a nine month period. And, uh, the railroad company estimated that 28 people were killed by these lions. Uh, but Patterson himself said that it was closer to 135 people. Whoa, that's a big difference. Yeah. And again, a but shit ton of people. They, after, after the lions were killed, their skulls and their skins were kept. And in 2009, a team of biologists were able to do analysis on the hair and skin samples from these skins that were kept. And they were able to uh, look at the isotope ratios, which would enable them to determine the chemical makeup of the proteins in the lion's diet during the last months of their life. So they concluded in the last few months of their life, one of the lions had eaten 11 humans and the other had eaten 24 humans. And that meant, based on these numbers and based on the amount of information that they were able to find in the DNA, in the, or in the, not the DNA, in the um, hair samples, they found that one of the lions ate mostly herbivores. So it would have been, you know, deer, things like that. But one third of its diet was based solely on humans. And the other lion, two thirds of its diets would have would have been humans. So one of them preferred humans more than the other, hmm. which is kind of creepy because they were together. So you'd think they would have, you know, been eating the same thing. But one of them was like, no, fuck that. I want more people. <laughs> Give me them. Give me them chicken wings. Yeah, to hear that those weren't eating 100% people is odd because that's a huge number of people in nine months. Well, those those figures weren't even for the whole nine months either. That was just for uh, the last few months of the tiger's life. Shit. So, I mean, you can, you can see, even if you're looking at just one of them, that's 24 people that were killed in just a few months, not, not even the whole nine months. Jeez. Yeah, I think the, the railway was trying to downplay it, you know, so they don't have to worry about taking any, uh, taking any flack from, from people about the railway killing people. Maybe even paying out family members of the deceased. Yeah, also a possibility. But yeah, it's, uh, just imagine working there, you know, like at what point are you like, nope, it's not worth it anymore. I don't want to be eaten alive by a lion while I'm sleeping. That was a big part of the film too. Those those guys were like, "Yeah, you kill this pair of fucking demon cats, or we're out of here." Which I mean, that had to have happened, right? That after the first dozen, somebody had to be like, well, "Fuck this." Well, you you also need to think these people were from India, so they were hundreds, if not thousands, of miles away from their home country. Mm hmm. Hmm. You know. So I don't know. I don't know what the what the deal was, but I know that I would be like, but but then again, like, what do you do? You 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 leave. It's like, okay, go fine. What are you going to do? You're not going to be protected. Yeah. You, you'll walk by yourself back wherever you're going. <laughs> I think I'd be more. I'd be like, I'll take my chances in the camp. I guess. Oh man, that thing just seemed to go and pluck people out whenever they wanted. Yeah, yeah, terrifying. Man. We've talked about many times about how, uh, how weird animal sounds can get. Just imagine them just hearing one of them chewing on one of your 
co-workers for like 45 minutes. Yeah. Like you, you hear that you hear your coworkers screaming and then all of a sudden it's silent. And then you just hear the crunch of his bones and the tearing of his flesh. Oh man. Ugh. <laughs> no, thank you. But since we're, we're telling a story from Africa, I've got, I've got another one that's, it's not lion related though. Have you ever heard of Gustav, the Nile crocodile? No, I haven't. They made a movie about him like probably 10 years ago or more. It was called Primeval. And it was, I didn't, when it, when I went to see it, I didn't even realize that it was based on a real thing. I thought it was just about like a killer crocodile. Like I thought it was going to be Jaws on the Nile basically, <laughs> but it wasn't. Uh, but this this crocodile Gustav is a massive Nile Nile crocodile from Burundi in in Central Africa, and he's known as being a man eater. And there's rumors that he's killed up to three hundred people. Whoa! Does that number seem more impressive to you because it's a crocodile, a slow yes. moving? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. But the number itself is difficult to actually verify because, you know, they're not sure if it's, if all of these people that have been killed by crocodiles are Gustav. Um, but he's reached mythical status and is completely feared by people in the region. And as far as anybody knows, he's still alive, but he hasn't been seen since 2005. Hmm. But uh, he was named Gustav by Patrice Fay, who's a herpetologist that had been studying him throughout most of the 90s or the late 90s. Um, but uh, there was also a documentary made about Gustav called Capturing the Killer Croc, and it was on PBS in 2004. But um, it, it, this documentary was their attempt to capture Gustav but they were unsuccessful in doing so. Even though they had, had been studying him for years, they really only had a couple of months due to uh, the the political environment in the region. But uh, Gustav himself is estimated to be between 18 and 25 feet long. And based on that length, he would be about 2,000 pounds. That's like a mythical creature size that's what's the average size of one of these fucking things well there there have been um there have been some that have reached around 20 feet the largest is i think it was seven meters but it wasn't in africa it was an indian crocodile but in parts of asia and australia there's saltwater crocodiles that grow up to 20 feet long man but I, th I think with uh, crocodiles, they keep growing throughout their life. So long as they're able to get food, they're going to continue to grow. And based on what they know about him, people originally thought he was around 100 years old because of how big he is. But a 100-year-old crocodile is not going to have all of its teeth. And Gustav appears to have most of its teeth. So they're estimating he's probably around 60 years old and could still be growing. Oh, man. But he's able to be identified because he has three bullet scars on his body. And then there's also a, he's got a scar from a wound on his right shoulder as well. But there's nobody who's come forward as saying that they were the ones that shot him. So the, the stories sur surrounding these scars on his body are unknown. He owed another crocodile some money. Yeah, <laughs> got a little cap in his ass. Now, the people who are studying this guy were able to see him. I mean, were yeah, wow, yeah. They've they, there's pictures of him. Oh wow, yeah. I'm gonna have to look that up. Yeah, he's he's a big motherfucker, man. No, he's certainly not not any Florida alligator, that's for sure. But because of his size, um, the the scientists that have been studying him think that his size might be the reason why he hunts people because with his massive size and weight he wouldn't be able to catch the prey that that crocodiles usually will go after um, typically they will eat fish or antelope or zebra and 
because he's not able to attack this regular food source, he's going to attack easier food sources. So he'll go for large wildebeests or humans or in some cases hippopotamuses. Whoa. But the the local warning from the people in the area say that he doesn't eat the people he kills. He just kills them and leaves their bodies uneaten. Hmm. So here we go with the serial killer aspect again. Yeah. Yeah. Just fucking assholes. But he um like I mentioned, he was last seen in 2015, and uh, the last sighting of him, he was seen dragging an adult water buffalo into the water. Now think about how big an adult water buffalo is. I just was. <laughs> That's uh, so I'm looking at the pictures of him now, and there's even a yeah. picture where somebody's made a model of how big he was, and they're standing next to him. I mean, that thing's a goddamn dragon. Yeah, he just doesn't breathe fire. He Breeze bubbles but underwater while he death rolls people. There was a, um, I, I love this story because it kind of lends a uh, supernatural ability to him, but it's probably just coincidence. But um, when, when the film crew was filming capturing the killer croc, they had, they were trying to capture him and they set up a baited trap. And the basically the way the trap looked, it was a cage, a one-ton cage that was 30 feet long, and they baited the end of the cage so that he would go into the cage and then they could capture him. And they had an infrared camera inside the cage. And they tried all different kinds of bait, and they set up snares in the cage, and they weren't able to catch him. So they tried to set up snares outside of the cage, bait the snares, and they were able to catch smaller crocodiles, but they weren't able to catch Gustav. So in the last week before they had to leave the country, they set up a live goat in a cage and nothing happened until one night a storm rolls in, knocks out the camera, and the next morning the cage was found partially underwater, no trace of the goat whatsoever. Hmm. That is a weird touch to the story. Yeah, yeah. It's like Jurassic Park when that goat disappears. <laughs> Yeah, it was just here a minute ago. What the fuck? Man, and they got to witness that. That's crazy. Yep, but because the storm knocked out the camera, they couldn't see what happened to the goat or what submerged the cage. It was good old Gastiv. Maybe. Or maybe it was a ghost. <laughs> so since we're talking about creepy things in the water, maybe now's a good good time to jump into that shark story. Hey guys, a quick bit of business. We wanted to say thank you guys for listening and also thank you to Studio. Studio is a headphone company who makes top of the line headphones. Mike, did you know that they're hand fucking made? I didn't know they're handmade, but I know that my own hands put them on my head and they're so comfortable upon my ears. It's lovely. They are all lovely headphones. They're, they're all top of the line stuff. Uh, if you guys listen to a lot of podcasts, you spend a lot of time with headphones on your head. And if 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 I'm not recording with Mike, I'm editing stuff or listening to other podcasts myself. Uh, I, I know Mike listens to stuff at work. It's, headphones are a big part of our life. So um, Studio is an awesome company that helped us out and decided to sponsor the show. And along with that, they have a discount code that you can use at studio.com. That's S-U-D-I-O.com. Just enter the coupon code what and get 15% off your purchase at checkout. So if if you guys are uh, in the market for some new headphones, I highly recommend checking them out. They've, they've got a bunch of different styles, but they've got top of the line earbuds. If you don't want anything covering your ears, you just want to stick some little beans in there and and uh, really high quality sound out of those. And then they've got um, the the pair that I have are, are the Regents, and they're they're really nice. They're they're your standard noise canceling headphone, and mine are black and they're beautiful, and I fucking love them. Yeah, if you're not impressed enough with the quality of the headphones, you're going to be impressed with the way they look. They're made with customer ideas in mind, and you, I mean you can look. They look. Some of them look like you'd be wearing a tuxedo and have these in, and they would fit with your getup. 
And, and the best part is the company is named after a Phil Collins song, so... Yeah, if you got a couple of you chuckled when we said the company name, you, you got it. It's from the Phil Collins song. Yeah, so I hope you all have that song stuck in your head. And then you'll never forget the website, so then you can go to the website, studio.com, and sing Su Su Studio while you're doing it. And put in what at checkout, get 15% off your purchase, get some awesome headphones, and, you know, just be a cool guy. So go there, and we'll continue talking about murder animals. Let's do... This is the story about the Jersey Shore shark attacks from 1916. You guys may have heard about this story before. It was the inspiration for Jaws. but uh, Even though it wasn't a great white shark. No. It, but it was. It, it, was it just gets a bad rap, man. Yeah. Didn't the author of Jaws say he regretted? Yeah. Yeah, because before that, um, a lot of people didn't even think of sharks as being something to be afraid of. You know, they like we obviously people were aware that sharks existed, but it was pretty widely known that sharks didn't eat people. So mm. it wasn't anything that they worried about, you know, until Jaws. And then it was like, oh, fuck, it's going to eat everybody. And now, I mean, even still, like you have people today that like that have never seen Jaws and you show them Jaws now and they'll be like, oh, look how shitty the fucking shark looks. But it's in their head now that sharks eat people even before seeing Jaws. It's just, it's part of public consciousness now. Yeah, I watched a few documentaries on this story, the, the Jersey Shore shark attacks, and they make a lot of mention of how, like, the authorities were like, well, we didn't think they'd fucking hurt anybody. <laughs> it was weird. Yeah, it is weird. You know, I mean, you, you've got to, th- for, well, okay, so so the, it was a bull shark, right? They think or they they think it was a bull shark. Mm. So bull sharks can can get up to nine to nine or ten feet at their biggest, which I mean is is pretty big, but it, it's no great white. Mm-hmm. But the the thing about the makeup of a bull shark, and then I and this is why they lean towards the bull shark idea, is because bull sharks are able to live in fresh water, and there have been several cases of bull sharks being located hundreds of miles away from an ocean. They'll just follow a river upstream and end up somewhere in the middle of a state, you know, away from the ocean where they've got no business being, but they're able to survive. And a lot of bull sharks will hang out at the mouth of rivers where the river empties into the ocean and they'll hang out there and occasionally make their way upstream. Well, this story takes place, like I said, in 1916, And it was, they call it the 12 Days of Terror. It was only 12 days where the shark was active in around the Jersey Shore. It left four people dead and one injured. Now, this summer was a particularly rough one for the entire East Coast. There was a deadly record-setting heat wave that struck the area. And along with a major polio outbreak, it caused thousands of people to head towards the Jersey Shores to seek some type of relief from the heat and try to not to get polio. But the first victim of this shark was a dude named Charles Van Zandt. He was 25 years old and him and his family were on holiday from Philadelphia. Now, early on into their vacation, Van Zandt decided to go take a brief swim in the ocean, which was his first fucking mistake before a a planned dinner with his family. And I'd like to point out that if this is before dinner, it had to be getting kind of dark, right? Which is like a double fuck no for going swimming. No, not in the summer. That's true. in the summer, it doesn't get dark till like nine. Well, witnesses stated that almost as soon as he got into the water, he began to shout. And at first, bystanders believed him to be yelling for his dog, which he had brought with him to the beach. But after a few moments, the beachgoers realized that he was in trouble and struggling to stay above water. One lifeguard, as well as one onlooker, jumped into the water to help Van Zant, but quickly noticed uh, what was causing all this dude's discomfort and screaming. He was being eaten by a shark. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> Both rescuers state that as they pulled Van Sant to shore, the shark followed, and it almost beached itself in the oh, process. Shit. Yeah, it was fucking going for Relentless blood. Relentless fucking shark. God damn. Yeah. As they say, that shark was playing for games. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess so. I would have been screaming the entire time while I swam with this dude. As I got Like see- a girl? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I hope so. If you're going to scream the whole time, that's the only way to do it. (laughs) 
I would have ran off the beach, ran into my car, started the engine, and still been screaming. Drove home. Screaming the whole way home. You enter the door just <laughs> screaming like a schoolgirl. Yeah. Your wife's like, what's going on? There's a shark. <laughs> Weeping like a fucking little baby. <laughs> I would have done that if I just saw one, let alone have it chase me onto the goddamn beach. <laughs> well, yeah. You're not supposed to be on the beach. You're a shark. That's Sharks right. stay in the water. <laughs> uh, but they said that once when, once Van Zant was out of the water, the rescuers noticed that all the flesh from his left thigh was gone. He was rushed to the nearby Ingleside Hotel where he bled to death on the manager's desk. You sure it wasn't the east side? <laughs> no. Okay. No. And in true Steven Spielberg fashion, the shark attack was ignored and all the beaches were left open. <sighs> Chief Brody tried to warn you, man. Yeah. Now you're going to get super bitch slapped by that super bummed out mom. Yep. Yep. It's true. But soon after this first attack, reports of a giant shark prowling the waters... From Newark all the way to New York were reported by beachgoers and sea captains alike. The second shark attack took place on July 6th when Charles Bruder, 27 years old, was swimming some 130 yards off the shore when his screams were heard by a fellow swimmer that was nearby. She then alerted the two on-duty lifeguards that she heard some screams and spotted an overturned canoe that was red in color. The two lifeguards grabbed a paddle boat and made their way to the capsized craft. But as they got closer, they noticed that it wasn't a boat at all. It was Bruder. Both his legs had been bitten completely off and had received a bite to the abdomen so severe that it was nearly split in two. He bled out before they hit the beach. Holy shit. Yeah, so uh, as like you mentioned before, with sharks, they're usually curious. They take a bite. It's mm -hmm. a person. They take off. This shark repeatedly bit this dude. <laughs> yeah, it, it took off both legs and bit his stomach. This was a hungry, hungry shark. This was cold-blooded murder. Oh, that's so scary. It is. So, Mike, at this point, I wanted to ask you, if you were a devil shark hell-bent on downright murdering as many humans as possible, what's your next mm -hmm, move? Mm -hmm. My next move is to find more people and murder them. But you got to stay low-key. So you don't want to murder in the same place. So I'd go the next town over and, you know, just cruise down the stream a little bit. As soon as I see a motherfucker, though, I'm chomping that bastard. <laughs> I'm taking out the legs. I'm taking out the dick. I'm taking out the stomach. If I can bite his neck, I'm going to bite the shit out of that neck. <laughs> now, are you hoping the dick gets caught in your mouth while you're biting a leg? Or are you just going for the junk? I mean, I'm just going for the... For any soft dangly bits that I can just tear off because I'm a fucking shark. Anybody uh, doing some nude swimming is in double yeah. jeopardy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bite your titties off. <laughs> <laughs> well, this shark had a little bit more chutzpah than you or I. As a wise man once said, you never back down. Did he down. start attacking people in the houses? <laughs> he, he became a land shark. He hated people so much he <laughs> learned how to breathe air. And then he attacked the people where they slept in their beds, unsuspecting of the shark attack. <laughs> Feeling unsatisfied with his murder spree thus far, the, sh the shark went to sniper school. You know, I feel like I could kill more people if I would go on land and learn how to shoot a gun. Well, he didn't do that, but what he did was double down. The next three attacks <laughs> took place on July 12th, some 30 miles oh, away. From the last attack on this. Three all, in one day. Yes. Three all in the same day. But you were right. He did move 30 miles away. Yeah. Well, see, he's smart. You don't shit where you sleep. <laughs> uh, at about 2 p.m., a small group of schoolboys took a swim in a nearby creek, not the ocean. As we know, sharks, well, most of them anyway, like we were talking about this bull shark that can go into fresh water. But the, all the, the attacks thus far were taken to place in the sea. So these kids thought they were safe. Uh, by swimming in this little creek. You always think you're safe in the backyard, yep. but you're not. That's where the sharks get you the most, in your backyard. <laughs> With high-powered rifles. With high-powered rifles and laser scopes. Well-trained military shark sniper. The occasional RPG. 
While these boys were swimming, they noticed what they described as an old, black, leather-beaten log. And they thought that's what it was until a dorsal fin broke the water's surface. Until that log bit them, and they knew it wasn't a log at all. <laughs> it was a murder shark. Well, they, they broke for the, the dock or whatever they used to jump into the water, because they realized it was this man-eating shark swimming right at them. And once the boys got to the land, they turned around to see one of their buddies... One Le- less Stillwell, eleven years old, being yanked right under the water. So these kids ran into town to try to find some help for their friend, and they found a group of men and told them what had happened. A large group of townsfolk that was quickly growing started to follow these men back to this creek with these kids, uh, fearing that the boy of me had a seizure because nobody believed that a shark was attacking these kids in a creek. A bunch of dudes jumped in the water to search for the boy. A few seconds later, 24-year-old Watson Fisher emerged from the water with the boy in his arms. As he swam back to shore, in full view of all these people from the town, Fisher was violently tugged back underwater, losing his grip on the boy's body. Fisher's- Murder shark! <laughs> Murder shark. Fisher's right thigh was gone. He bled to death at the hospital. The boy's body was found 150 feet upstream two days later. Wow. Yes, so this this fucking shark is a murder. It's shark. a fucking murder. He didn't even eat that kid. He killed the kid and then waited for somebody to come help and then fucking kill them. But just some 30 minutes later, a 14-year-old named Joseph Dunn was attacked while swimming by a nearby dock. He was saved by his brother who held on to him as the shark and him engaged in a lovely game of tug of war with his little brother's body. That's but, not grisly at all. No, not at all. But he was, he survived. He was taken to the hospital and fully recovered. So that, I love that this shark uses like the, the sniper tactic of wounding someone and then waiting for someone to rescue him so he can kill them too. <laughs> what a fucking asshole. I couldn't believe that when I read that shit. I mean, I had it, I went, I had to check a couple different places to see how, how truthful that was. But this fucking shark killed two people in the same fucking creek. I mean, probably within the same hour. <laughs> Murder shark. <laughs> so, like you had mentioned, we're, we're used to hearing shark attacks where somebody gets bit while they're on their surfboard because they're confused for being a seal or something like that. But this is just so not the case. It's This thing was literally just killing people to kill people. What if it wasn't a shark, though? Go on. What if it was an aquatic barn owl? That's most likely the case. I mean, if there were stab wounds, I, w- I would lean more towards it a just- barn owl. It bit so fast that it looked like a full shark mouth, but it was really just really fast owl bites. That'd be hilarious. Well, these parts are not jagged at all like normal teeth bites. Seems like a giant If I didn't know any better, I would say it looks like an owl bite. (laughs) But owls don't live in the water. Meanwhile, aquatic barn owl. (laughs) It just jumped out of the water and started flying away. (laughs) They'll never suspect a thing. So... 12 days, four people, and lucky little Joseph Dunn got to survive. Can you imagine the trauma of that, though? How do you recover from that? Do you ever go back in the what, water? attacked by a shark? Yeah. No, well, not just that. A shark that's fucking offing everybody. This fucking... Now, I, to me, I, I think the scariest thing is that it attacked people in fresh water. And that, that, I think, would be the most traumatizing thing of all. Like, if you get attacked by a shark in the ocean and you survive, you're like, you know what? I went into his world and I survived. Fuck yeah. But if you're you're swimming in a fucking stream and you get attacked, I don't know if I'd ever want to go into fresh fresh water again, you know? Like if they're if if sharks don't belong there, yet I almost got eaten by a shark. Where where am I safe? Yeah, I mean, isn't that where like at that time? I wouldn't some... even get a water bed. <laughs> I wake up one night feeling a bump, something bumping up. Like, what is what is that? All of a sudden, a fucking shark eats me in my waterbed. Looks like fucking Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> Just a blood geyser erupting from my waterbed. Or you hear a big crash on your window and you look and it's a flying aquatic barn owl. Either way, terrifying. Completely terrifying. It also just fortifies my theory of you don't have gills, you don't go in the water. 
Gustav says otherwise. <laughs> he says, come on in. Gustav doesn't have gills, but Gustav loves the water. So, Gustav shoots down your theory, Mateo. <laughs> Gustav would probably eat a bull shark. Probably has. And probably will again. Thank you for listening to the Whatcast. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, iTunes, and YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Get yourself a Whatcast t-shirt or a sticker pack. Who was that dude on that one episode? Try the links in Homie's page. All this and more can be found at www.thewhatcasters.com. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.